Easy strength might be one of the more interesting things I've done in my entire career. I would put easy strength alongside the Olympic lifts and loaded carries as the three biggest training game changers in my career. Uh, but to fully understand easy strength, we need to talk a little bit first. There's a great book, and I, and I recommend it to everybody involved in fitness. It's called Think Like a Freak, and it's by the authors of Freakonomics. And they say two things in there that really changes the way a good coach, especially a good strength coach, should think. The first one is this. Knowing what to measure simplifies life. Well, the strength coach, it's load. If your lifts go up, well, then I'm right, or your strength coach is right. That's what you're in the weight room to get, stronger. Now, yes, there's other qualities, but we'll get to that later on. And of course, the number two one, one that really made me laugh out loud as I was reading the book, and because it's such a pillar of how I coach, most people have a fear of the obvious. To get stronger, lift weights. If you want to improve your running, run, sprinter, sprint, jumpers, jump. I've said it way too many times. Now, is there an easy way to get strong? Well, this is why I'm going to teach you in this lecture. One, you have to lift heavy. Now, heavy is a difficult thing to explain to a lot of people, but generally lifting heavy means that over time, the load is going to go up. Next, and I'm a big believer in this, you need to do the fundamental human movements. You need to keep your reps and sets low. I don't think you can volume getting exceptionally strong. Now, people have used volume to do amazing things. Gymnastics, calisthenics, obviously triathlons and marathons and all the rest. But to get strong in the weight room, it doesn't tend to work. The next one is going to be a hard one for somebody to listen to. Stop your sets and your workouts before you get fatigued. Fatigue has, fatigue training has its values. But the problem is many of us got caught up, many Americans got caught up in the 1960s with this whole, you know, win one for a gipper, uh, uh, all those little cliches we used to say about fatigue. And there is a place for it. But as everything happens, we went overboard for it. If you want to get stronger, you have to avoid fatigue. The next one's tough. Don't even struggle. Learning to get stronger is like learning how to type faster. It doesn't help you to miss a bunch of keys and just keep pushing forward. Writing gobbly 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 gook isn't going to help your reader understand what you're trying to do, even if you type it really, really fast. The next one is something that I think every good strength coach figures out. Marty Gallagher, a good friend of mine who worked with Ed Cohen, once told me, Ed never missed a training rep. And he went on to be the greatest lifter of all time in powerlifting. This next rule, basically never miss a rep. Keep plenty in the tank and keep coming back. I do wish I'd have known that one because many of my injuries come from trying to get one more. And remember, folks, in the world of strength, conditioning, and elite performance, more is just more. More is not better. Now, there's some pros and cons with easy strength. Let's look at the pros first. There are deep roots of it in our history of lifting. One of the most interesting things when I first start working with young strength coaches is their total lack, their gap, of any knowledge of the history of strength. Um, not only did they not know the famous bodybuilders and maybe movie stars who made it big, but they don't even know um, the strongman tradition. They don't know... Um, the Olympic lifting traditions. They don't know power lifting. They don't, many of them don't realize that the bench press might be one of those modern exercises they do. Uh, it's relatively new exercise compared to all the rest. Squat racks changed so many things for most lifters. Uh, when power lifting meets first happened, they had these little teeny squat racks with little pins like that, that to hold the weights on, that completely changes the way you squat. So easy strength's been around a while. Just because you don't know it doesn't mean it wasn't around before. The most interesting thing I get is what I call here, it's a little joke, but positive and absolutely shocked feedback from users. I get this all the time. 
I, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I did, uh, and they'll go on this little story about on day 22, magically, my lifts all went up. I know that because the same exact thing happened to me. If you're not using performance enhancing drugs, you really need to consider the style of training. Enough. It's great for what I call quadrant three athletes. Uh, we'll get to that in the quadrants lecture. Fat loss clients tend to do very well with it. You save all your energy and free will for the nutritional side of things because fat loss happens in the kitchen and what I call everybody else's. Um, I make an important point here, uh, which we'll come back to. Stop letting football wag the tail of the strength coach's job. Uh, American football is great, but the problem with it, with it is it tends to have a lot of focus when uh, football teams start doing things, especially when you see it on a television program or an ad. People begin to believe that's the way you train. And of course, the way I train is to do this idiotic thing and then drink a very expensive bottle of something that's got just a little bit of sugar and a little bit of uh, salt in it. And it's very good for busy people. Um, when I was doing this first time, I had two full-time jobs, two young daughters, and I was getting my workouts knocked out at the most in 15 minutes. Now, there are some problems with it, the cons. Yes, Arnold did not do this because Arnold was a bodybuilder. Was he strong? Yeah, he snatched 242 and clean and jerk 303, I believe. And those are lifts I made within the first six months of me Olympic lifting. Yeah, it's strong, but it's not really strong. Uh, as always, American football and bodybuilding seem to dominate the strength and conditioning con discussions. Now, since the advent of anabolics, probably the late 50s, early 60s, depending on where you were, you don't see this kind of thing in the popular fitness writing. It's because, as one person told us at the Olympic Training Center, anabolics are the answers to all questions. I don't think that was the policy he was supposed to share. QT athletes, uh, quadrant two, that's collision sports and collision occupations, still need armor building. They still need to do things like tumbling and certain other exercises to get them used to uh, contact. Easy Strength doesn't provide that. Since the workouts don't take very long, many athletes just discount it, poo-poo it. It's not very good. And that's always the problem with athletes. Many athletes would rather do a thousand crunches because they feel something versus something as simple as a set of 10 ab wheels, which probably does better work for the ab wall and is probably safer for the lower back. And then finally, the big con... <laughs> It is tough for the modern athlete to think on their own and logically pick loads that feel right today. There are no percents in this program and there are no given tonnages. There's no given load. You, the athlete, have to figure out what feels light today and what we should move on to from there. I can't tell you that. Some of the feedback I get in emails, it, it, when I'm there, it's easier because I can instantly talk about it, but you know, I, I went for this lift you know, whatever, 100 kilos, and it just felt terrible. Well, my response right back, well, you should have stopped. That's too heavy. And it's interesting that I have to send an email to tell somebody that their load was too heavy. So how do we know it works? Well, it does. Uh, I There's a show called South Park, which I find very funny, has this wonderful episode about the underpants gnomes. And they say an interesting thing. Phase one is they collect underpants. And then they take their hands and go like this. The reason I think that's funny is because Professor Durchi did that to explain the invisible hand in Adam Smith's concept of capitalism. And then after you do this, you get profits. Well, basically, I'm telling you this. You do easy strength, wiggle your fingers, you get stronger. Folks, if it works, it works. And don't forget about experience and phenomenology when you're training people. The two tests I use to prove things are very simple. The first is the farmer walk for distance. I have pounds here, but for my inter international listeners, very simply, um, the farmer walk for distance would be about 100 meters. If you're under 60 kilos, use 60 kilos. If you're 60 to, oh, about 85 kilos, 
uh, use 85 kilos. From 85 kilos to about 95 kilos, use 95 kilos. And then everybody above 95 kilos uses 100 kilos. The two tests I use are this, the farmer walk and the standing long jump. I use both of these not to assess the athlete, but to assess our program. If the standing long jump and the farmer walk with body weight improve, I assume the program is putting us on the right direction. Almost universally, when the standing long jump goes up, good things are happening. A quick little side point. I don't know how to cheat on any of these two exercises. I don't know any one sitting around, sneaking in ways to get around them. Uh, I don't mind seeing my athletes practicing these moves because I figure the farmer walk is going to help with their work capacity and the standing long jump is going to help teach their neurological system to boom. So I have nothing wrong with that. Um, it is possible to be in a program like on a mass building program where your standing long jump goes down. And I'm okay with that because if an athlete gains a lot of mass in a short period of time, which can happen with good programming or puberty, sometimes the body can't yet keep up and they'll lose a little bit in standing long jump. I don't like to see the farmer walk come down almost ever. Uh, Eric Cressy, a great strength coach here in the United States, said it best. He said that absolute strength is a glass. And everything inside the glass, everything else is the liquid inside the glass. So if you're not very strong, you have a shot glass and you've got a little teeny bit of liquor, uh, water in there. If you have a pitcher, you've got a lot more water in it. Of course, if you have a keg, you have even a lot more in there. So the stronger you get, the better you'll be at your flexibility work, the better you'll be at mobility work, true. Uh, because you're strong enough to move things through things and it's going to help you with your power and everything else. Is there a load limit on strength? I don't know, but I'd much rather err on the side of having a lot of absolute strength than to try to figure everything out with just a shot glass. I make this joke all, all the time right now. I'm going to give you the world's fastest personalized program. Whatever they are not doing, do. And this uh, Rocky in the original Rocky Balboa said it. Very interesting. I don't know. She's got gaps. I got gaps. Together we fill gaps. So before we walk into easy strength, most of the time when I coach people, before I even get into any fancy programming, the first thing I try to do, what gaps do you have? Do you push? Almost universally, yes. Do you pull? Almost universally, not enough. Hinge? What's that? Squat? No. Loaded carries? Never heard of them. And of course, the sixth movement, which is basically groundwork or brachiating, which is monkey bars, is also skip too. So what I might do sometimes in a personalized program is just make you do that. What? I'm going to make you do generally this the goblet squat, which is a deep squat, and farmer walks. Um, I have made differences in very large programs by simply getting people to do goblet squats and farmer walks. So... To review, before we start, is there an easy way to get strong, lift heavy, do those fundamental human movements I just went over, especially the ones you've never done before, keep your reps and sets low, stop at fatigue, don't struggle with the weights, and keep coming back and coming back and coming back. Now, let's get into the history. My first coach, in 1965, my aunt died, and she left us some money. So... My brothers went out to Sears and bought the Ted Williams barbell set. When they came home, this was the little uh, booklet that came with it. I later went online and bought this, probably for more money than the original uh, weight set and book. But this is the Ted Williams workout set. Now, Ted said something interesting how you should train. Basically, everything should be two sets of five, and basically everything should be over your head and from the floor. Uh, I just have two exercises of many in there, but he's got a deadlift with a shrug variation and clean and jerk. Ye, uh, clean and press, pardon me. I mean, I hate to say this because I might be wrong, but if all you did was clean and press and deadlift, you'd probably cover a lot of the bases. So this is the very first program I saw, and it's funny because it took me my whole career almost to come back to the, what I learned in 1965. 
Now the threads of easy strength are also floating around at the same time. So we got my experience with Ted Williams and two sets of five over your head and pick it up off the ground. But at the same time, two great people were having this conversation. George Hackenschmidt, who gave us the hack squat, and Percy Cerruti, who was a uh, Australian distance coach, begin having these letters. And they start writing letters back and forth. And then later they meet, and here's a picture of the day they met. Cerruti was a great believer in weightlifting for runners. He had his runners uh, do two things that I still think have great value for every athlete. First, run hills. He wasn't a big believer in the squat as, you know, you can argue either way on that. But in my experience, I found the squat to be the same issue Percy had, is that you can get a big squat, but not improve performance. Now, I know when I say that out loud, there's people going, ha, but you can really push up squat numbers and not see the discus go farther, the high jump go higher, and those kinds of things. But the other thing he also believed that everybody, even marathoners, should lift weights. And he believed that the standard was a body weight bench press and a double body weight deadlift. That's his standard for marathoners. And as I work with athletes day in, day out, I keep telling them, you've got to be at least as strong as a marathoner before we can call you a strength athlete. Percy had a very simple system. One, he had people do a deadlift. Two, some kind of press in the copy I have, he is uh, emphasizing the bench press, though you'll find other resources that he recommends the overhead press. An explosive full body move. He did a variation of the swing at the time called the dumbbell swing. For pulls, he liked pull-ups and something called the cheat curl. I explained it there. It's a power clean with a curl grip and some kind of ab exercise. Uh, and again, look at his recommendation. Two to five sets of two to five reps. So two exercises, five reps a piece, or five sets of five, or two sets of two, which is great in-season training. But right here, when I read this for the first time in 1991, I went, wow, this guy's got something right. His image of off-season training, pre-season training, and in-season training is still some of the most clarity I've ever seen in training track and field athletes. Now, of course, I didn't pay any attention to all this. And by 2003, I was a pretty broken athlete. I met Pavel Satsuli in that time down at uh, Charles Staley's boot camp. And I realized something, and uh, my joke here is my gap, I was chasing too many rabbits. Uh, if you chase two rabbits, you go home hungry. And I was highland gaming, Olympic lifting, discus throwing. And so my training was long and exhausting. Pavel told me this. For the next 40 workouts, pick five lifts. Do them every workout. Never miss a rep. In fact, never even get close to struggling. Go as light as you need to go and don't go over 10 total reps in a workout for any of the movements. It's going to seem easy. When the weights feel light, add more weight. I have never done a simpler program. In this first go round, uh, I did uh, incline bench presses. We'll just hold that. And I, ch I chose inclines because I hadn't done them since 1979, this is 2003. My PR was 300 pounds. Uh, 22 days into the program, I took 315 pounds with no spotter uh, on a freezing cold day in my garage with my wife's brand new car at, the, at my feet. So if I'd have missed, it'd have been bad and I did 315 pounds for two reps. I added 15 pounds to my lifetime best and an additional rep with no spotters, and it felt so easy. I think if I would have pushed it with a spotter, uh, I don't know, I, I, I was about to say five, but I know I was good for more. I was shocked how strong I got and how easily I got strong. So let's go through the rules now of the easy strength or what's sometimes called the 40 day program. For the next 40 days, do the exact same, do the exact same training program every day. Now that is the most, the best variation. That's the one that works the best. However, I will give you two more and I'm going to regret that because that's what's going to throw you off. Some people need more variation. So after 
two weeks on the basic program, you can do a little variation. Like, for example, go from bench press to incline. After two weeks of that, you could do declines. After two weeks of that, you could do military press. That might work well for somebody who's got a lot of experience. Uh, there is no learning curve on any of those moves and has a good sense of what light is going to feel like on every one. Variation three is what I give, and I hate to say this because it's going to hurt people's feelings, to older athletes, and that's athletes in their late 20s and beyond. Uh, at my age, and you hear someone's old at 28, it breaks your heart a little bit. And that's very simply, you'll do two weeks of the standard easy strength, and week three will be dynamic explosive moves. Uh, you can do uh, you know, uh, squats followed by sprints. You can do the Olympic lifts if you know them well enough. Uh, you could do certainly uh, more extensive explosive work. It all depends on what you know and what you're more, most comfortable with. Now, the athletes I've had do this have ended up having some of the best performances of their career the year before the Olympics. Sadly, and this happens a lot, because it works so well, they stop doing it. When you hit a certain age, you cannot keep throwing your face into the wall anymore. Um, for the record, and I mentioned this, I found that most of my goals and most people's goals are reached by day 20 or 22. So if it doesn't work out, you could certainly shrink this down to a, a different number depending on what your long-term goals are. That's rule one. Rule two, just pick five movements. Now we're going to go through this again and again. Um, People will argue with me on this, but no one has ever really made the squat work well. Any squat variation. Uh, I keep trying to think about why, and I keep wondering if that the if the squat is just too complex of a of a movement. It, maybe there's too many moving parts when you do this. Uh, to make easy strength work with Olympic lifting, uh, you really have to shrink the numbers down and the exercise selection down. We will continue to look at how to make the squat work, but generally I tell people, do either goblet squats or overhead squats in the warm-up if you need a warm-up for your easy strength days. Uh, there are days, by the way, in easy strength, you don't need a warm-up. You sort of always feel like you're ready to lift. It, it, there is a cliche we use a lot in our world. Uh, the key to the 40-day program is we want to increase your hinge, but just maintain your squat and your squat movement. Generally, you focus on these five, and I'll give you some more information in just a moment. A large posterior chain movement, the deadlift, and variations. A surprisingly good variation is either called the straddle deadlift or the Jefferson deadlift, depending on where you're looking online. And that's the deadlift where you step over the bar and you have your left hand forward and your right hand back. Small little thing. You'll do the next set this way. And with that, we recommend one set of five this way, one set of five this way, and you're done. Uh, don't do two sets on both sides. It'll it'll burn you up. An upper body push, that's the bench, the inclined military. An upper body pull. Um, I got to tell you, I've got pull-ups and rows there, but those heavy power uh, curls are quite good too. A simple full body explosive move, like a kettlebell swing or snatch, or loaded carries. And then some kind of simple, um, I call it anterior chain, but some kind of movement like this. I love the ab wheel here, but a lot of people who've had some shoulder or lower back issues, um, the hanging leg raise, especially the bent knee variation, and the L sit can be wonderful uh, additions to the program. Uh, if you do the L sit for a 40 day program and you just play around with it every day, by the end of time, you'll be shocked at how solid you are in that position. I'm not going to say you're an Olympic gymnast, but you get very good. Number four, the reps are minimal. Only do two sets of five per workout for the deadlift and the push-pull exercises. Only two sets of five. This next number on the explosive movement, the kettlebell swing or the kettlebell snatch, those numbers keep tumbling down. Uh, years ago, I would say up to 250. That, that worked, but only one time. Then we said, oh, 75 to 125. Now... We're down to 20 to 50 total. Remember, you're going to do this five days a week. You're going to get your reps in. 
Um, you can do a solid single set of five reps with the, with the ab wheel or the hanging leg raise. Certainly, you can slide that up to one set of 10. Or if, if you need, you can do two sets of five. The nice thing about the ab wheel, the hanging leg raise, uh, and the L sit is you're, you're just gently coaxing yourself into that movement. You're not trying to, you know, go for the burn or whatever the phrase is today. These are some other rep schemes that have worked. Uh, two sets of five, five sets of two, three sets of three, six singles. Now, if you're just doing singles, you got to keep you got to keep the six because the load gets heavy. A set of five, go up. A set of three, go up. Seventy-five to two hundred and fifty total reps on swings have worked. It just hasn't worked for everybody. The other thing you can also do, and when you read the follow-up to this called even easier strength. You can actually put two sets of five, five sets of two, three sets of three, six singles in the five, three, two into a logical format uh, over a two week period. Now, this next part is very hard for the great ones. This is the hardest part if you're elite. Number five, never plan or worry the, about the weight or the load. Always stay within yourself and go heavy naturally. So if you're doing 165 today, it's 165. Even if your best is 495, it's 165. That's what felt right, or that's what sounded right. In a few days, it can be 185, 205, 405. Stay within yourself. And then the next part is this. <laughs> it's kind of a joke, but number six, don't eat chalk, don't scream, don't pound the walls, don't sniff anything. Do each lift with the least amount of emotion and excitement you can find and have perfect technique. None of this finishing with the elbow, it's gotta be smooth every single rep. And that is a challenge for a lot of elite lifters. What you're trying to do is turn everything down and smooth everything up. So as we start to make the U-turn and come home here, as I sit back and I look at Pavel's advice to me, that last line there is the most important. When the weights feel light, add more weight. I didn't say there, when you can grind a, a last rep and your buddy is deadlifting, I often joke that the strongest people in the weight room at most gyms are the guys who do all the deadlifts pulling the bench presses off their friends. Um, you've got to have the courage to start light and then add weight. And when I say that loud sometimes, the simple logic makes me want to laugh out loud. The best three movements I know, I call the three verticals. The vertical pull, the deadlift, and the vertical press. Those three have worked well the most for nearly anybody who's done the program. So overhead presses, that's military press, behind the neck press if you're uh, if your shoulders can ha handle it, many people can't. Uh, the double kettlebell press, deadlift and deadlift variations, and pull-up and pull-up variations tend to work best. So here's what works. Press, pull-up, deadlift, loaded carry variations. Um, by the way, I don't care what you do. I don't, the key if you're doing loaded carries on easy strength, every day vary the load, the distance, the time, something. Come up with all kinds of new ideas. That's the farmer walk prowler, uh, bear hug carry is wonderful. With the kettlebell swing, uh, I have an older number here, 75 to 125 per workout, vary the load. Five, ab wheel, two sets of five or one set of 10, uh, whatever works for you, or vary it every day. Now, the strength coach can support elite performance in three ways, as we'll go over again on a lecture called Now What? With appropriate heart rate, appropriate physical tension and arousal and relaxation and appropriate arousal. The best thing about easy strength is, is I am teaching you to lower your arousal with heavy weights. I am teaching you to find the right level of tension and relaxation to, to get a lift. To, if I need to bench press, if I can bench press 405 and I'm doing 315 for two sets of five, I'm going to have to practice going, keeping my arousal level down and find that simple place on the 
tension relaxation uh, dial right there on the dial and turn it up to get the reps in, but no higher. That is a tough skill. And finally, let's talk about easy strength and what are the values of it. One, easy strength, <laughs> I write here, supports the need for strength. <clears throat> easy strength makes you strong. Two, it can be used in conjunction with appropriate heart rate, tension, and arousal. And those three, to me, are the keys to elite performance. You want your arousal and tension levels to match what you need to do at the performance at that time. And then the thing that most people miss until they start, until they finish a round or two of the 40-day Easy Strength program, it takes so little recovery to do this program. And recovery, folks, is the key to coming back and being great.